This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri, in February 2006. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 14. By and by, when we got up, we turned over the truck the gang had stole off of the wreck, and found boots and blankets and clothes, and all sorts of other things, and a lot of books, and a spyglass, and three boxes of cigars. We had never been this rich before in neither of our lives. The cigars was prime. We laid off all the afternoon in the woods talking, and me reading the books, and having a general good time. I told Jim all about what happened inside the wreck and at the ferry boat, and I said these kinds of things was adventures, but he said he didn't want no more adventures. He said that when I went in the Texas, and he crawled back to get on the raft and found her gone, he nearly died, because he judged it was all up for him any way it could be fixed. For if he didn't get saved, he would get drowned, and if he did get saved, whoever saved him would send him back home so as to get the reward, and then Miss Watson would tell him South Shore. Well, he was right. He was most always right. He had an uncommon level head for a nigger. I read considerable to Jim about kings and dukes and earls and such, and how gaudy they dressed, and how much style they put on, and called each other Your Majesty, and Your Grace, and Your Lordship, and so on, instead of Mister. And Jim's eyes bugged out, and he was interested. He says... I didn't know they was so many in em. I hain't heard about none in em, scarcely, but old King Solomon, unless you count stem kings that's in a pack of cards. How much do a king get? Get? I says. Why, they get a thousand dollars a month if they want it. They can have just as much as they want. Everything belongs to them. Ain't that gay? And what they got to do, Huck? They don't do nothing. Why, how you talk? They just sit around. No, is that so? Of course it is. They just sit around, except maybe when there's a war, then they go to the war. But other times they just lazy around, or go hawking, just hawking, and sp- Shh! Do you hear a noise? We skipped out and looked, but it weren't nothing but the flutter of a steamboat's wheel way down, coming around the point. So we come back. Yes, says I. And other times, when things is dull, they fuss with the parliament, and if everybody don't go just so, he whacks their heads off. But mostly they hang round the harem. Round a witch? Harem. What's de harem? The place where he keeps his wives. Don't you know about the harem? Solomon had one. He had about a million wives. Why, yes, that's so. I, I done forgot it. A harem's a boarding house, I reckon. Most likely they has rackety times in the nursery. I reckon the wives quarrels considerable, and dat creased a racket. Yet they say Solomon de wisest man did ever live. I don't take no stock in dat. Because, why? Would a wise man want to live in the midst of such a blim blamin' all the time? No deed he wouldn't. A wise man had taken Bill a biler factory, and then he could shut down the biler factory when he want to rest. Well, but he was the wisest man anyway, because the widow she told me so her own self. I don't care what the widow say. He weren't no wise man nother. He had some of the dad fetchedest ways I ever see. Does you know about that child that he is gwine to chop in two? Yes, the widow told me all about it. Well, then, weren't that the beatenest notion in the world? You just take and look at it a minute. That's the stump there. That's one of the women. Here's you. That's the other one. I Solomon, and dish your dollar bills to child. Both and you claims it. What does I do? Does I shin around amongst the neighbors and find out which un you de bill do belong to, and hand it over to de right one, all safe and sound, de way did anybody that had any gumption would? No, I take and whack de bill in two, and give half in it to you, and de other half to the other woman. That's the way Solomon was gwine to do with the child. 
Now I want to ask you, what's the use of that half a bill? Can't buy nothing with it. And what use is half a child? I wouldn't give a dern for a million in em. But hang it, Jim, you've clean missed the point. Blame it, you've missed it a thousand mile. Who, me? Go long. Don't talk to me about your points. I reckon I know sense when I sees it, and they ain't no sense in such doings as dat. Dispute warn't about half a child, dispute was about a whole child, and de man that think he can settle a dispute about a whole child, wid a half a child don't know enough to come in out in de rain. Don't talk to me about Solomon, Huck. I knows him by de back. But I tell you, you don't get the point. Blame de point. I reckon I knows what I knows. And mind you, the real point is down further. It's down deeper. It lays in de way Solomon was raised. You take a man that's got only one or two chillin. Is that man gwine to be wasteful of chillin? No, he ain't. He can't afford it. He know how to value em. But you take a man that's got about five million chillin run around house, and it's different. He as soon chop a child in two as a cat. Days plenty more. A child or two, more or less, warn't no consequence to Solomon. Dad fetch him. I never see such a nigger. If he got a notion in his head once, there warn't no getting it out again. He was the most down on Solomon of any nigger I ever see. So I went to talking about other kings and let Solomon slide. I told about Louis Sixteenth, that got his head cut off in France long time ago, and about his little boy, the Dolphin, that would have been a king. But they took and shut him up in jail, and some say he died there. Poor little chap. But some says he got out and got away and come to America. That's good, but he'll be pooty lonesome. They ain't no kings here, is they, Huck? No. Then he can't get no situation. What he gwine to do? Well, I don't know. Some of them gets on the police, and some of them learns people how to talk French. Why, Huck? Don't the French people talk the same way we does? No, Jim. You couldn't understand a word they said. Not a single word. Well, now, I be ding busted. How did that come? I don't know, but it's so. I got some of their jabber out of a book. Suppose a man was to come to you and say, Polly v o u Franzi. What would you think? I wouldn't think nothing. I'd take and bust him over the head, that is, if he warn't white. I wouldn't allow no nigger to call me dat. Shucks, it ain't calling you anything. It's only saying, Do you know how to talk French? Well, then, why couldn't he say it? Why, he is a saying it. That's a Frenchman's way of saying it. Well, it's a blame ridiculous way, and I don't want to hear no more about it. They ain't no sense in it. Look at here, Jim. Does a cat talk like we do? No, a cat don't. Well, does a cow? No, a cow don't know t h e r Does a cat talk like a cow, or a cow talk like a cat? No, they don't. It's natural and right for em to talk different from each other, ain't it? Of course. And ain't it natural and right for a cat and a cow to talk different from us? Why, most surely it is. Well, then, why ain't it natural and right for a Frenchman to talk different from us? You answer me that. Is a cat a man, Huck? No. Well, then, there ain't no sense in a cat talking like a man. Is a cow a man, or is a cow a cat? No, she ain't either of them. Well, then, she ain't got no business to talk like either one or the other of em. Is a Frenchman a man? Yes. Well, then, Dad, blame it, why don't he talk like a man? You answer me, Dad. I see it warn't no use wasting words. You can't learn a nigger to argue. So I quit. End of chapter fourteen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri, in February 2006. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. By Mark Twain. Chapter fifteen. We judged that three nights more would fetch us to Cairo, at the bottom of Illinois, where the Ohio River comes in, and that was what we was after. 
We would sell the raft and get on a steamboat and go way up the Ohio amongst the free states and then be out of trouble. Well, the second night a fog begun to come on, and we made for a towhead to tie to, for it wouldn't do to try to run in a fog. But when I paddled ahead in the canoe with a line to make fast, there weren't anything but little saplings to tie to. I passed a line around one of them, right on the edge of the cut bank, but there was a stiff current, and the raft come booming down so lively she tore it out by the roots and away she went. I see the fog closing down, and it made me so sick and scared I couldn't budge for most a half a minute, it seemed to me. And then there weren't no raft in sight. You couldn't see twenty yards. I jumped into the canoe and run back to the stern and grabbed the paddle and set her back stroke. But she didn't come. I was in such a hurry I hadn't untied her. I got up and tried to untie her, but I was so excited my hands shook so I couldn't hardly do anything with them. As soon as I got started, I took out after the raft, hot and heavy, right down the towhead. That was all right as far as it went, but the towhead weren't sixty yards long, and the minute I flew by the foot of it, I shot out into the solid white fog and had no more idea which way I was going than a dead man. Thinks I, it won't do to paddle. First I know I'll run into the bank or a towhead or something. I got to set still and float. And yet it's mighty fidgety business to have to hold your hand still at such a time. I whooped and listened. Away down there somewheres I hears a small whoop, and up comes my spirits. I went tearing after it, listening sharp to hear it again. The next time it come I see I weren't heading for it, but heading away to the right of it. And the next time I was heading away to the left of it, and not gaining on it much either, for I was flying around, this way and that and the other, but it was going straight ahead all the time. I did wish the fool would think to beat a tin pan and beat it all the time, but he never did, and it was the still places between the whoops that was making the trouble for me. Well, I fought along, and directly I hears the whoop behind me. I was tangled good now. That was somebody else's whoop, or else I was turned around. I throwed the paddle down. I hear the whoop again. It was behind me yet, but in a different place. It kept coming and kept changing its place, and I kept answering, till by and by it was in front of me again, and I know the current had swung the canoe's head downstream, and I was all right if that was Jim, not some other raftsman hollering. I couldn't tell nothing about voices in a fog, for nothing don't look natural nor sound natural in a fog. The whoopin' went on, and in about a minute I come a-boomin' down on a cut bank, with smoky ghosts of big trees on it, and the current threw me off to the left and shot by, amongst a lot of snacks that fairly roared, the current was tearing by them so swift. In another second or two it was solid white and still again. I sat perfectly still then, listening to my heart thump, and I reckon I didn't draw a breath while it thumped a hundred. I just give up then. I knowed what the matter was. That cut bank was an island, and Jim had gone down the other side of it. It warn't no towhead that you could float by in ten minutes. It had the big timber of a regular island. It might be five or six miles long, and more than half a mile wide. I kept quiet with my ears cocked, about fifteen minutes, I reckon. I was floating along, of course, four or five miles an hour, but you don't ever think of that. No, you feel like you were laying dead still on the water, and if a little glimpse of a snag slips by, you don't think to yourself how fast you're going, but you catch your breath and think, my, how that snag's tearing along. If you think it ain't dismal and lonesome out in a fog that way by yourself in the night, you try it once. You'll see. Next, for about a half an hour, I whoops now and then. At last I hears the answer a long ways off and tries to follow it. "'but I couldn't do it, and directly I judged I'd got into a nest of towheads, "'for I had little dim glimpses of them on both sides of me, "'sometimes just a narrow channel between, "'and some that I couldn't see I knowed was there "'because I'd hear the wash of the current "'against the old dead brush and trash that hung over the banks. "'Well, I weren't long losing the whoops now amongst the towheads, "'and I only tried to chase them a little while anyway, "'because it was worse than chasing a jack-o'-lantern.' You never know to sound dodge around so, and swap places so quick and so much. I had to claw away from the bank pretty lively four or five times, to keep from knocking the islands out of the river, and so I judged the raft must be buttoning to the bank every now and then, 
or else it would get further ahead and clear out of hearing. It was floating a little faster than what I was. Well, I seemed to be in the open river again by and by, but I couldn't hear no sign of a whoop nowheres. I reckon Jim had fetched up on a snag, maybe, and it was all up with him. I was good and tired, so I laid down in the canoe and said I wouldn't bother no more. I didn't want to go to sleep, of course, but I was so sleepy I couldn't help it. So I thought I would take just one little cat nap. But I reckon it was more than a cat nap, for when I waked up the stars was shining bright, the fog was all gone, and I was spinning down a big bend, stern first. First I didn't know where I was. I thought I was dreaming. When things began to come back to me, they seemed to come up dim out of last week. It was a monstrous big river here, with the tallest and the thickest kind of timber on both banks, just a solid wall, as well as I could see by the stars. I looked away downstream and seen a black speck on the water. I took after it, but when I got to it, it warn't nothing but a couple of saw logs made fast together. Then I see another speck and chased that, then another, and this time I was right. It was the raft. When I got to it, Jim was settin' there with his head down between his knees, asleep, with his right arm hanging over the steering oar. The other oar was smashed off, and the raft was littered up with leaves and branches and dirt. So she'd had a rough time. I made fast and laid down under Jim's nose on the raft and began to gap and stretch my fists out against Jim, and says, "Hello, Jim. Have I been asleep? Why didn't you stir me up?" Good gracious, is dat you, Huck? And you ain't dead? You ain't drowned? You's back again? It's too good for true, honey. It's too good for true. Let me look at you, child. Let me feel you. No, you ain't dead. You's back again, live and sound. Just the same old Huck. The same old Huck. Thanks to goodness. What's the matter with you, Jim? You been a drinkin'? Drinkin'? Has I been a drinkin'? Has I had a chance to be a drinkin'? Well then, what makes you talk so wild? How does I talk wild? How? Why ain't you been talking about my coming back and all that as if I'd been gone away? Huck, Huck Finn, you look me in the eye, look me in the eye. Ain't you been gone away? Gone away? Why, what in the nation do you mean? I ain't been gone anywheres. Where would I go to? Well, looky here, boss. Day's something wrong. Day is, is I me or who is I? Is I here or where is I? Now dat's what I wants to know. Well, I think you're here plain enough, but I think you're a tangle-headed old fool, Jim. I is, is I? Well, you answer me this. Didn't you tow out the line in the canoe for to make fast to the towhead? No, I didn't. What towhead? I ain't seen no towhead. You hain't seen no towhead. Looky here! Didn't the line pull loose and the raft go a humming down the river and leave you in the canoe behind in the fog? What fog? Why the fog? The fog that's been round all night. And didn't you whoop and didn't I whoop till we got mixed up in the islands? A one of us got lost and the other one was just as good as lost, case he didn't know where he was. And didn't I bust up again a lot of dem islands and have a turrible time and most get drownded? Now ain't that so, boss? Ain't it so? You answer me dat. Well, this is too many for me, Jim. I hain't seen no fog, nor no islands, nor no troubles, nor nothin'. I've been settin' here talkin' with you all night till you went to sleep about ten minutes ago, and I reckon I done the same. You couldn't have got drunk in that time, so of course you've been dreamin'. Dad, fetch it. How was I gwine to dream all that in ten minutes? Well, hang it all! You did dream it because there didn't any of it happen. But Huck, it's all just as plain to me as it don't make no difference how plain it is. There ain't nothing in it. I know because I've been here all the time. Jim didn't say nothing for about five minutes, but sat there studying over it. Then he says, "Well, then, I reckon I did dream it, Huck. But dog my cats if it ain't the powerfulest dream I ever see." And I hain't ever had no dream before that's tired me like this one. Oh well, that's all right because a dream does tire a body like everything sometimes. But this one was a stavin' dream. Tell me all about it, Jim. So Jim went to work and told me the whole thing right through, just as it happened. Only he painted it up considerable. Then he said he must start in and interpret it. 
because it was sent for a warning. He said the first towhead stood for a man that would try to do us some good, but the current was another man that would get us away from him. The whoops was warnings that would come to us every now and then, and if we didn't try hard to make out to understand them, they'd just take us into bad luck, instead of keeping us out of it. The lot of towheads was troubles we was going to get into with quarrelsome people, and all kinds of mean folks, but if we minded our business and didn't talk back and aggravate them, we would pull through and get out of the fog and into the big clear river, which was the free states, and wouldn't have no more trouble. It had clouded up pretty dark just after I got on to the raft, but it was clearing up again now. Oh, well, that's all interpreted well enough as far as it goes, Jim, I says. But what does these things stand for? It was the leaves and rubbish on the raft and the smashed oar. You could see them first rate now. Jim looked at the trash and then looked at me and back at the trash again. He had got the dream fixed so strong in his head that he couldn't seem to shake it loose and get the facts back into its place again right away. But when he did get the thing straightened around, he looked at me steady without ever smiling and says, What do they stand for? I was going to tell you. When I got all wore out with work and would call in for you and went to sleep, my heart was most broke because you was lost, and I didn't care no more what become of me and de raff. And when I wake up and find you back again, all safe and sound, de tears come, and I could have got down on my knees and kissed your foot, I was so thankful. And all you was thinking about was how you could make a fool of old Jim with a lie. Dat truck is trash. And trash is what people is that puts dirt on de head of their friends and makes em ashamed. Then he got up and walked to the wigwam and went in there without saying anything but that. But that was enough. It made me feel so mean I could almost kiss his foot to get him to take it back. It was fifteen minutes before I could work myself up to go and humble myself to a nigger, but I done it, and I weren't ever sorry for it afterwards neither. I didn't do him no more mean tricks, and I wouldn't a done that one if I'd a knowed it would make him feel that way. End of chapter 15